Welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. All right. So, Colin, this week we wanted to rebroadcast an episode we did a few years back, episode 42. And the reason we're doing that is we are quickly approaching another election cycle. And just as we were back when we did this original episode, things were getting pretty contentious in the country, and we were getting a lot of questions from young CGOs, people aspiring to be CGOs. What do I do about, at the time, racism? Yep. What do I do? How do I interact with my folks? How do I engage with this critically important topic as a member of the profession of arms. And so we did the episode. It's one, frankly, Colin, I'm very proud of. This is one of those that really meant a lot to me as we yeah. we learned a lot going through its very valuable information. Well, here we are again. Fast forward a couple of years and we are entering the midterms. And even though racism is not currently in the media as the number one topic, there are many that could be. Yeah. So just a quick rundown of things. The House is currently conducting their hearings on the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. Abortion rights have been in the media quite a bit. COVID is still here. Gun violence has been, again, brought up as a hot topic. So as you go through this episode, you could probably insert any one of those four or any others that you know are impacting you, impacting those you love, impacting your troops. and you can just put that topic in where we discuss racism in particular. Because the principles we're gonna apply, we're gonna discuss, I think apply broadly. And this can happen in 20 years from now. These same principles will apply to whatever the topic of the day is. So with that, Colin, we're gonna turn it over to you and I as we rebroadcast episode 42, and then we'll come back and talk about a few things at the end. Times have been pretty crazy, to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. With everything that's been going on lately, with the onset of COVID-19 and the rise in political and social tensions across the country and the associated protests, combined with the upcoming campaign season ahead of this November's presidential election, there's an opportunity here for us to discuss a very important topic and specifically about freedom and what is our role as officers in the Air Force to protect the freedoms of others while at the same time having to give up some of our own. Yeah. We wanted to point out too that this was a question directly from a listener. So thank you, LT, for pushing out this question. Really timely and very good question. Bottom line, the question was roughly how do we engage right now? What is our role? in society and in our units, how do we deal with these tensions? How do we address the situation and maintain appropriate civil military relationship? Like, how do we navigate this time? Because it's a pretty complicated mess and it's actually a lot more complicated for members wearing the uniform than it is for your normal civilian. Right. So thanks again for the awesome question. Keep sending us those recommendations and engaging with us. That's one of the favorite things about doing this podcast is hearing from you all. So with that, we're going to have to outline a couple caveats at the beginning of this. For sure. First and foremost, we are not lawyers. We are not providing legal advice. We're doing everything we can to present you all with some information. A lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is clearly legal stuff. It's legalese. It falls squarely in that realm. But that's not our knowledge, skill, and ability. We're not going to try and talk authoritatively. We're not going to even give examples and say, 
for example, this is what you can and can't like. We're not even going to do that because we don't want to get you or anyone else or ourselves into any hot water legally. We're just going to present you with information, tell you where you can go get informed and just get the conversation started because we have to start now. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, it takes a lot of time and effort, especially when we need to arrange an expert to join us, such as a judge advocate general or JAG, an actual Air Force lawyer, someone who can provide the expert opinion on this sort of topic. But we felt that because this topic was so timely that we wanted to lean forward in getting this information out to you. Still, the hope remains that we will eventually be able to bring a JAG on to the show and maybe address this topic further. But again, we did not want to delay. Yeah. So two more things before we go into kind of the meat and potatoes we're going to talk about today. If at any time you feel we are advocating for members of the military to not exercise their First Amendment rights. That's not our intent. What we are doing is trying to outline the clear legal restrictions that exist on those and other rights because you are a member of the profession of arms. And we have an entire separate legal code that we also have to adhere to, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. These codes have been upheld by numerous U.S. Supreme Court decisions and have a long-standing history in being sustained. You just need to know that. You know, we're not saying here's what you can and can't do. We're providing you guidance on where you can find information about where you can and can't do. And at the end of the day, if you have any questions, go find your chain of command, go find your local JAG office and get some specific answers. That's one thing I drummed into the brains of my poor cadets constantly. You know, we had to stand up and give lessons about all this stuff. I'm not a lawyer. But I know the phone number of the lawyer. Yeah. So if you have questions, who do you call? You call JA, call them. They're the people. So if you get stuck, if you get confused, I'd be actually surprised if you weren't getting some of this pushed out from your local leadership. I know we've already received a number of official communications from our local JA office. Hey, if you want to go to the protest downtown, here's what you need to know. And he gives us all the rules. So those things are happening out there. So Colin, let's kind of get into what are we specifically addressing today some of the freedoms that we give up when we put on the uniform. Yeah, absolutely. You know, true to our form, we try to point to the official policy as much as we can that governs this kind of stuff so that you know where you can go to see this information for yourself. So that's our goal today is to highlight some of these things out of DOD instruction and Air Force instruction. In this specific case, we're talking about Air Force Instruction 51508. It's titled Political Activities, Free Speech, and Freedom of Assembly of Air Force Personnel. The DOD instruction equivalent is 1325.06, Handling Dissident and Protest Activities Among Members of the Armed Forces. And then the last one is Air Force Instruction 1-1, titled Air Force Culture, which each of these different instructions will help you to recognize how officers in the Air Force must behave at all times, whether they are actually wearing the uniform or acting in a private capacity, these things will still apply. Exactly. So let's just get to it and let's kind of start. Well, first off, what is the First Amendment? One of the things that covers in that is the freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Right. We're not going to go into all of the major cases that the Supreme Court has heard to decide how the left and right bounds of freedom of speech. But generally speaking, the freedom of speech is not absolute. There are very small and specific restrictions on that for most of the civilian population. However, yeah, so not just on us as uniform members of the Air Force, but there are restrictions on freedom of speech for our civilian counterparts. Yeah, but that list is pretty short. The list is pretty short, to be honest, on the things that civilian can't say and can't do in that regard. However, that is not the case for members of the profession of arms. We actually have quite the list. So let's just kind of go through a couple articles of the UCMJ. Probably the biggest one, we'll start with Article 88, contempt towards officials. And it states, any commissioned officer who uses contemptuous words against the president, the vice president, Congress, the Secretary of Defense, 
the secretary of the military department, the security of transportation, or the governor or legislature of any state, territory, commonwealth, or possession in which he is on duty or present shall be punished as court martial may direct. That's a lot of people. Yeah, that's a lot of people that you can't say contemptuous words against. And let's tie back to 1-1, Air Force culture. It specifically says social media counts as that speech. Yeah. So does that mean you can't maybe, again, we're trying to stay away from examples, but anytime you're acting in a public way and speaking to include social media, you can't use contemptuous words against those people. Yeah. And just very quickly, by contemptuous, we mean you know anything that is intolerant or scornful or insulting or derogatory, mocking, you know, any of these adjectives for contemptuous, it's all about using words in the negative against one of these individuals. Yeah. So, and this keeps going on. You can't behave with disrespect towards a superior commissioned officer. You can't use insubordinate actions against a warrant officer, senior NCO or NCO. Nor can you encourage that in anybody else. Yeah. And this list goes on for quite a while. We're not going to go through every part of the UCMJ, but the point is there's actually quite a bit of restrictions on what we can say. So that's why we've got these Air Force and DOD instructions is to help outline the right and left limits on your behavior. That includes protest activities. That includes assembly and freedom of speech, which those are sacrosanct in the Bill of Rights. So we've outlined that there are restrictions. We've given the instruction on where to find them and recommendations for how our audience can get more specific guidance than from two non-lawyer hacks here on the podcast today. (laughs) (laughs) But what we can talk about and what I hope we can spend most of our time talking about today is the why, the so what. Yeah, exactly, Reed. There is a very long list of things that we cannot do, but I think it's important that we take a quick minute here to highlight the things that are explicitly allowed for Air Force officers to engage in, such as you are allowed to file complaints against those people that we mentioned earlier, your superior officers, even up to the President of the United States, you are allowed to submit a complaint. Yeah, submit a complaint does not equal a Twitter rage, though. Right. But that's the really interesting thing, right? Like, And we'll get into the why in a minute here. But there's this huge long list of specifics because there's significant implications for members of the profession of arms and the way they speak. So we'll get into more of that. The next thing that you can do is you cannot be stopped from talking with your political representatives, members of Congress, Senate, et cetera, or the inspector general. Those are also people that you're not allowed to be stopped from talking to, which is, again, kind of in that formal complaint realm, right? Yeah, yeah. So those are called protected communications. You are allowed to engage with them, let them know that such and such situation is going on and you will not experience any sort of retaliation for speaking with those people. Exactly. So like we mentioned, there's this long list of things you can't do, a small list of things you can do, and we have to get into all these specifics. But where I hope we spend most of our time today and where we really think the bulk of our beneficial conversation can be held is in the why, the so what, right? Why do we have these restrictions on speech? Why do they apply uniquely to members of the military? Why does that exist? And I want to start this with one of my favorite quotes from our first president, George Washington. He said in communication out to his captains at the time, you know, while he was still serving in the regimental militia in Virginia, discipline is the soul of an army. It makes small numbers formidable, procure success to the weak, and esteem to all. Yeah. There's a lot in there, Reed. Can we break that down a little bit? Yeah. And this is all under the guise of this really important characteristic of the military, good order and discipline, which is a fascinating topic. And I'm, I know we're going to talk more about it, but yes, let's break this down. The soul of an army, the spirit and body, it is the interior motivation. It is the ethos. It is the ephemeral, nondescript, yet present part of a corporeal thing. And it also encompasses the physical self. It is the army. 
you know, the discipline is the soul of an army. It's what gives it what it needs to do its job. Yeah. When I was working on my master's in 2013, 2014, I did some field research among the American population in the DC area, asking them various questions about how they see their military members. And by and large, there wasn't even a close second. The word that everybody uses to describe the armed force, to describe the armed forces, is discipline. That is the word of choice for the vast majority of people in the United States to describe who we are and what we do. Discipline. We should probably define discipline. Yeah. I mean, I feel this is like one of those things that you know it when you see it. Yeah. Right? But it's a little hard to define, but I think it's good to explore it. So the dictionary definition of discipline, it's slightly circular, and we'll talk about that. It is a practice or training of people to obey rules or a code of behavior, using punishment to correct disobedience. I think we think about that a lot, right? Like discipline is when you break the rules, you get disciplined, you get put in trouble a little bit, right? So that word is also associated with it. Yeah. The controlled behavior resulting from discipline. So if you exercise discipline, you begin to exude traits of controlled behavior, which we call... Which is discipline. Discipline, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, these are straight from the dictionaries, folks. I didn't make this up. You know, don't ask the scientists to define English terms. I'm just reading from the dictionary. Yeah. Blame Miriam or, or Webster, right? Or Oxford or any of the other ones. Yeah, I don't... Anyway, so the next thing, an activity or experience that provides mental or physical training. I think when I think this, I think of like the fighting arts, like karate or jujitsu, right? That's the discipline. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my parents put me into Taekwondo when I was an unruly 11-year-old so that I would learn discipline. Yeah, right. And it's from the physical and mental training, the activity involved in that, that generates discipline. As well as a follow-on definition is a system of rules of conduct within each of these martial arts, as well as in the military and other, you know, things like athletics, sports, there are rules that govern the way that you are allowed to interact with other people. Yeah, absolutely. Last thing, a branch of knowledge, typically one studied in higher education. It's pretty common in academia to say, oh, what's your discipline? Yeah. I was molecular biology. Colin, you've done a variety of things in higher education, so you've been in that world. Yeah, the engineering discipline, the discipline of the social sciences. Yeah. So you can kind of see how this really, it's a pretty broad definition that encapsulates a lot, but it's not just behavior, it's actions, a rule of ethics, a moral code, a system of punishing those who do not adhere to it. It's really all-encompassing. Yeah. And as we'll get into in a little bit, and what George Washington is highlighting to his military leaders is that discipline is central and critical and key to the success of the army or the armed forces. Yeah. So let's keep going with this quote here. Next thing he says, it makes small numbers formidable. Yeah, by comparison to the rest of the United States, the armed forces, especially the Air Force, is incredibly small based on the actual numbers. Yeah, we're a very small number, but formidable, I think, is a very good description of the amount of hate we're able to bring to a situation if we need to, right? We can absolutely bring the pain. And this reminds me of something else little story back to the Wayback Machine. So there were a number of Christmases, maybe six or seven years ago, in a row where as a family, we would go paintballing Yeah. on Christmas Day. A lot of fun. Paintballing is a whole lot of fun. Well, one of my former brothers-in-law was an infantry Marine, and he knew a thing or two about small unit tactics, about <laughs> how to yeah. engage with an enemy, you know, in small unit tactics and such. And... While by no means we were educated in the ways, but he gave us a couple hints, tips, and tricks. You know, like, hey, when they blow the whistle, it was an indoor paintball arena. It's like, when they blow the whistle, this is what we need to do. Like, oh, okay, you know, it's me. 
my two brothers, my dad, maybe a, an uncle or cousin and him, and then whoever else they threw on our team. And it was a tournament style where, you know, the first team to eliminate the other team won, quote unquote, you know. Well, we won like six games in a row and in really short order. We're talking like two or three minutes. Yeah. And the other teams were getting really, really angry because it wasn't even fair anymore. And we were a small group, but we had this idea of training. We had this idea of cohesion. We had this shared vision of what success looked like. Yeah. And this was literally like three minutes of talk before we went into the arena. Like it didn't take much. Right. But the effect of that was incredibly large. That was one of the first times I was able to personally witness the impact that a little bit of discipline can have in that type of arena. Six or seven years ago, weren't you already in the Air Force post OTS at this point? I was. Yeah. So I knew better than to bring my Air Force knowledge. I'm like, no, I'm going <laughs> to listen to the guy who actually has done this, right? I knew to listen to my NCOs. I knew. I knew that much. So you mean the paintball that they had taught you at OTS didn't provide you the skills that you needed to be successful in that environment? No. <laughs> <laughs> Without qualifications, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. So help us. If that's where we are, if we have to rely on airmen who got trained at OTS on paintball, if that's where we are, we have lost. <laughs> Period. <laughs> <laughs> so... Apparently, in that particular context, the discipline of the OTs at officer training school does not make them formidable. No, but that's not the objective of the paintballing. (laughs) But that's a whole nother conversation. (laughs) But you can kind of see what I'm getting at, right? Like, this is like five or six people with a little bit of knowledge. And what that did was remarkable. Yeah. It was remarkable. Yeah. As you were talking, a couple of thoughts came to my head. First of all, of think back to like the movie 300. You know, if you've seen it, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The ability of 300 Spartans to stand against the many thousands of Persian warriors at Thermopylae. It was because of their discipline as a result of the culture in Sparta that enabled them to, I can't say be ultimately successful, but they were definitely formidable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then another thought was to think about a much more recent example. Think about the New Zealand All Blacks, the rugby team there, and the pregame haka that they do together. This very small number of rugby players that put on this haka. And boy, are they formidable when they do that. I don't think there's anybody who can watch that and say, ah, they're just a bunch of jokers. No. They're serious. And that's the point of what they're doing there is to demonstrate their discipline, their cohesion, their unity as a team against any enemy that they're going to come up against. And that outward expression of cohesion, of unity, of knowledge and skill will come in play later. So keep that in mind, how important that idea of that outward display of an inward commitment becomes. We'll talk about that later as we go forward. Yeah. So then the last piece of this a quote from George Washington is procures success to the weak and esteem to all. Yeah, so much in there. Oh man, we're going to spend the rest of our podcast describing just those two things, right? So yeah. in our definition of discipline, the practice of training, the system of rules of conduct, branch of knowledge, controlled behavior, all of that comes from the act of exercising discipline. That is largely the fount from which our capabilities come from. Yeah, We are good at what we do because we are serious about it and we work hard at it and we have these rules that surround it and we have discipline when we, uh, see that word again, discipline. We have punishment to correct disobedience. We make it a branch of knowledge. All those things play into giving a vehicle to be successful in and creating warriors out of people who weren't necessarily that before they started. Yeah. This idea of procuring success to the weak. Before we come into the military, we are quote unquote weak. We have not yet been disciplined. But because, as you've been saying, but because of the discipline that enables our success and then 
esteem to all, meaning because of that discipline, the entire armed force benefits from the discipline of the others. We are all respected equally by the American people because of that reputation of discipline that we carry. And then you can apply that even more broadly, esteem to all, to include Americans as a whole. People do not want to fight against the United States because they know what our nation is capable of, not just our military, but the entire nation together. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll see again, that idea of esteem to all come up as we explore, again, this continuing idea of the so what, of why we have to restrict the members of the profession of arms, why their freedoms, their individual liberties are constricted versus the civilian population and what that does. And let's kind of transition to that. So, yeah. you know, Colin, as you and I talked about this and we did some writing and research ahead of time, I felt that discipline seemed to do different things for the different parts of our society. So we're going to break it down into two groups. So the first group is what does discipline do for the member of the military? Those that wear the cloth of the nation that are wearing the uniform, what does discipline give us? And as I thought about it, it gives us a group identification, right? A group identity. We wear a uniform with a name on us that says, I'm part of this group that gives us cohesion. And this is all the stuff that we see externally, right? Uniform wear, grooming standards, the words we use, our language, ritual, all that falls into this realm of what it does for the member. And it gives us that vehicle to exercise discipline. So that's one of the things it does for the member. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself standing in like a public area, especially like an airport, and you can pick out the members of the military, even if they're not in uniform, you can pick them out simply by the way that they stand, the way they carry themselves, the way they speak. Their haircut. Their haircut, obviously. (laughs) Yep. Glasses, their sunglasses that they have, (laughs) their backpack that any normal human being could live out of for about 72 hours yeah. Yeah. with their molly straps. Yeah, you can pick these folks out from, you can even pick out rank sometimes. You're like, that guy, that's a senior officer for sure. Yeah. He looks way too tired, right? <laughs> like you, you, can, you can pick these folks out. It's pretty easy. And yeah, it is fascinating because those external things that we do, they provide us that group cohesion, but they're a vehicle to exercise and practice discipline. Yeah. This discipline also promotes competency and efficiency in our actions. We actually get better at our jobs because we treat it like a discipline. Yeah. We practice, we exercise, we train, we focus, we eat, live, breathe, sleep, getting good at what we do, and therefore we get better at it. Yeah. So that goes back to that definition about an activity or experience that provides, that generates mental and physical discipline. Exactly. Something that you could think of that kind of stays in the group cohesion a little bit is drill. I know you're a big fan. And we do drill a lot early. And the purpose and point of drill is not so that you can get warheads on foreheads in 10 years. Right. It's the vehicle to demonstrate, to practice, and become disciplined. And it promotes competency in all areas. And when you focus on competency in everything you do and in discipline in everything you do, it exudes throughout so that in 10 years, when you are putting warheads on foreheads, you are now good at it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a culture, it's a perspective. Last thing it does for the member is it creates behavior and traits that will lead them to follow orders and compel them to participate in war without disobedience or regard to self. And I think that's a really important thing we need to talk about. The act of sacrificing yourself is unnatural. Oh, yeah. So this is where I can't help but, you know, look through my biology lens, right? Life wants to live. All of us, we want to live, right? Try going underwater and holding your breath for three minutes. Man, every cell in your body says, warning, (laughs) <laughs> this is not okay. I'm not okay with this, right? Yeah. It's the same thing that our bodies experience when you're under fire. Studies have shown the same exact chemical reactions, the same neurological pathways are activated. Everything that is happening when you are in combat is exactly the same thing that's happening when someone is choking you out. Yeah. Your body wants to live. So how do you create a population of people 
who not only willingly, but energetically, but professionally, but really well are willing to put themselves in harm's way. Yeah. And not only that, not only is it unnatural to sacrifice yourself, it is also unnatural for you to take the life of another person. It is. Yeah. I'll put my nerd hat on here. You know, J.K. Rowling's was onto something when, you know, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read the books, by the way, <laughs> to fracture the soul into seven parts, you have to take another life. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. She's onto something there that it is unnatural. It absolutely is. Yeah. Dave Grossman in his book on killing goes into the science very deep into this topic. And we'll link these books in the show notes to include J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter. Excellent. But it is important to recognize that we need discipline to help us get over that aversion of either sacrificing yourself when called for or taking the life of another person when that is required to accomplish the mission of the Air Force and the objectives for our nation. Yeah, absolutely. And as one who's been directly involved in the shedding of blood, there is blood on my hands. Aircraft dropped bombs on targets that I told them to and resulted in the loss of human life. I can attest to the toll it takes on your soul. And you do have to be disciplined in order for that to happen and to not completely affect you in a way that makes you mission ineffective, Right, which is the whole point, right? So those are kind of the things that happen to the member. Gives us group identity, group cohesion, all the rituals, et cetera. Promotes competency, makes us good at what we do. And it gives us the traits necessary in order to do things that are not natural yeah. to us. Now, on the flip side, what does our discipline do for society? One of the key things it does is it separates us from the rest of society. Why, let's talk about that. Why do you think that matters, Colin, that we're separate? Well, let's just go back to what we were just talking about, how we need a small group of people who are able to get over that aversion of sacrificing themselves or taking another life. We need that from them, but we definitely do not need that from the rest of society. We need society to maintain that aversion. We need them to not want to engage in the act of self-sacrifice or killing other people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We need to have that separation. Totally agree. I know that we've talked previously about you know, the problems associated with the civil military gap and how we want to narrow that gap, but the gap must remain. We can't eliminate it completely. Yeah, totally agree. And that is like a whole podcast in and of itself, right? The civilian military, right? But, and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about now. The discipline of the military builds trust between those two groups because they are separate, creating a visible and tangible demonstration of competence, seriousness, efficiency, and capability. So let's tie that right back to the haka that you were talking about earlier, right, Colin? Yeah. No doubt, right? I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about a good haka, right? Yeah. You know that they mean business and you give them your trust because they look competent. They look fearsome. They look strong. They look healthy. They look unified. Those things give you confidence in what they're going to do. You are confident that that team is going to go out on the pitch and give you a good performance. Yeah. Our version of the Hakka to the American people is our drill teams, spinning rifles, is our air shows, is our flyovers, is our museums, and those other touch points that we very purposely create and craft to provide those very limited opportunities for engagement between the military, our warrior class, and the rest of the civilian population. And I'd even break it down even further. The way you dress, the way you speak, the haircut you have, the way you engage with your fellow men day to day, all those things combined with everything you mentioned, I think plays a huge role in that perspective, that view that they have of us. And we each have a responsibility in maintaining that. And I know we'll get into that later. Yeah. And this is something that I learned about very recently and I want to share here because it's that powerful. When we're talking about building trust with the civilian population, 
trust in any context requires three things. One, character. And the type of person that is going to join the military is going to have character, strong, moral, and ethical character. It's a prerequisite. Yes. And we've talked about that in our foundational episodes. Second thing that they need is competence. And that's where this discipline is really strong, demonstrating that we are capable of doing the things that we say we will. And then the last thing in order to build trust is connection. You must have a connection with that other person. And it is those touch points that we just mentioned that are regimented, but critical to the relationship between, again, the military, the warrior class with the rest of the population. So character, competence, and connection leads to trust. And it is because of discipline in each of those contexts, in each of those points, that trust is able to exist between us and the American people. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to explore for just a couple minutes this idea of a separate warrior class. I mean, this was discussed at the founding of the nation. I mean, you can go into some of the Federalist Papers. This was a hot topic of conversation among the founders of the nation. Even the idea of a standing military was discussed a lot, this idea of having an armed force, because a military is essentially a state-sanctioned violent arm. Right. We has all the guns, Colin. <laughs> I, 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 you know, we, we, we have them. So that's been a big fear since the founding. And as a result of that, civilian control over the military has been a central foundational construct of our entire government. Yeah. Part of our checks and balances, the system of that is put in place that makes the whole thing work is built on that idea. So we have this civilian control over the military. It's completely foundational to the very structure of our nation. And we have to maintain that appropriate relationship. And that is what discipline does. It creates the conditions necessary to maintain an appropriate civilian military relationship. Everything we do, our haircuts, drill, uniforms, the way we speak, the way we walk, the way we engage politically, all of that maintains that balance. It says to the American people, we are competent, we are disciplined, and we work for you. And it's because of that numerous studies and surveys have been able to show that the United States military is consistently ranked as one of, if not the most trusted institution in in the country. And it is our responsibility to make sure that that stays in place. We want to maintain that trust. We want to maintain that gap that we mentioned, but keep it thin, but still maintain that trust with the rest of the country so that we are able to remain effective on behalf of the American people. By contrast, again, this is not making any sort of official statement or going outside of our lane here, but think about how our politicians rank as far as trust is concerned. Very consistently across these same studies and surveys, political institutions such as Congress and the executive rank dead last in levels of trust with the American people. And that balance is something that we have got to, we're simply reporting what we have observed and what has been reported in other official means. We're not making judgment statements on that. We want to make that very clear, right? Since we just spent a few minutes describing how we're not allowed to say anything against Um, politicians in the UCMJ. So this gets into like a really sticky situation, which kind of led to this whole conversation, right? So the members of the United States have freedom of speech with some very, very small restrictions. Members of the military have a lot of restrictions on their freedom of speech. Yeah, We've talked about why discipline is the whole point and how discipline is the vehicle that allows us to have the trust of the American people and how from the founding Civilian control of the military was essential. So now let's talk about the next so what, which is how this all works in reality. So how do we, as members of the military, live and engage in a world where our individual liberties and freedoms are constricted, but that allows for the freedoms of our nation? Let's try to connect the dots and talk about how that works day to day for members wearing the uniform. Yeah, absolutely. Our goal here is to not only provide the pedantic discussion on discipline and freedom, but give you some actual applicable takeaways that you can use in your growth and development as an officer in the Air Force. So first thing is that 
you have to be aware of what's going on around you and monitor and enforce these standards amongst yourself and the other people around you who wear the uniform. This is not easy, is it, Reed? No, no, this is really hard. We've talked a few times about how we think peer leadership is some of the hardest. When you're not actually in a position of power and authority over someone and they're your peer, to see them post something on Facebook that is clearly a UCMJ violation and could get them in some serious hot water to message them and say, hey, guy or gal, friend of mine, with all the love in my heart, you can't be saying stuff like that. Yeah, and I actually want to say thank you to you particularly, Reed. There was an instance, I'm not going to go into any of the details, but there was an instance a few years back where I shared something and you reached out to me and said, hey man, I really think that you shouldn't have done that. So, and because you did that, I recognized my mistake and was able to correct it. So that is a very difficult thing to do, especially if you don't already have a relationship like what you and I had. But it is absolutely critical that you enforce the standard wherever it is that you see it. Because you have to recognize that the standard that you walk by is the same standard that you will accept. Yeah. And that's something that applies to just about anything you see that needs to be corrected. But in this regard, it's really tough being able to, you know, stick your neck out a little bit and risk that relationship, right? Because that's what makes this hard is you have some sort of relationship with this person. It could be really deep and meaningful. It could be perhaps a little bit more transient or new even. Yeah. I find it when you're the new guy or gal, then it's a lot harder to say something, but it's essential. Because again, let's tie it all back together. The discipline that we demonstrate is what gives the American people their trust in us and allows us to do our jobs. And it is that trust and our ability to do the jobs that provides them the freedoms that we're fighting for. So I know it seems really silly to tie a random Facebook post or a tweet to the freedoms of our nation, but I'm going to call it, it is. They're all linked together. And it's the accumulation of all of those things which have resulted in the trust of the American people towards their military. And we must maintain that. It is crucial. It is essential to the very fabric of our nation that you and I and every person that we work with maintain that trust. Yeah, this is how we maintain good order and discipline. A Facebook post or an Instagram post or anything like that especially Twitter. Oh man, Twitter. Those things are the anathema to good order and discipline. They can be. They can actually do exactly what we need them to do. It depends on how they're used, right? Yeah, it's true. So let's bring in some current stuff that's going on right now. So there has been a lot of unrest, specifically surrounding racism in our nation right now. Yeah. And our very own chief of staff, General Goldfein, and Chief Master Sergeant Wright held a almost two-hour Q&A on racism. And they did that without one time highlighting any member of the executive branch, any member of the representative branch, without discussing the rightness or wrongness of any politician's actions in any way. They were able to have a meaningful and, I felt, very powerful discussion on who we are and what matters to us and what we need to do as a service to, again, warrant the trust of the American people. And that is how you can have that. And that was on Facebook Live. Yep. Right? So I think you can do both, but it's about the words you choose. And that's why we want our audience to not just listen to this podcast today, although we think that's wonderful. And thank you for joining us today. We really want you to get into the instructions. You got to go to the DOD instruction. You got to go to the Air Force instruction talk to your JA. Again, you're going to get official communication about this, but you've got to do some studying so you can know where those lines are. Yeah, for sure. And what they did, what General Goldfein and Chief Wright did, brings me to my next point about things that we want you to take away from this, is that we want you to actually talk about what's going on, but stay focused on the issues, not the people involved. The issue is race. The issue is how do people of differing colors, backgrounds, experiences, morals, ethics, or whatever, how do we interact with each other as human beings? That is the issue. We should not be concerned about the specific names involved. 
the specific people are important to the discussion. But as an officer in the Air Force, focus your particular piece of it on the issue, not the people. Yeah. And this is really hard stuff. It's going to be tough. You know, we've had some conversations in my squadron lately that were incredibly fruitful. I learned a lot. And I think things are changing for the better amongst the people who had that conversation. But again, there are lines. Understand where they are, learn where they are. Hopefully this will get you started on that path because this is stuff we have to address. We are a part of the American people. Yeah, These are our problems just as much as they are the civilian population's problems. So it's not like we can say, oh, because we're separate, we can take ourselves out of this conversation. We absolutely cannot do that. So how do you do this? How do you start talking about these issues? One, you have to be informed. Read what's going on and actually read it. Don't just see the headline and say, oh, yeah, that's everything I need to know from that particular article or the title of a book. And the things that you should read should be from multiple trusted sources of various perspectives. Don't find yourself stuck in a specific silo of one perspective or the other. You as a protector of all American people need to be informed on all perspectives. So that's the first thing going on there. Second thing is start with your own thoughts and your own feelings. Do not concern yourself with the thoughts and the feelings of other people until you have a firm grasp on where it is that you stand, where it is that you come down on an issue. Do not shy away from topics or perspectives And then once you have that, do not shy away from the other topics and perspectives that you may disagree with or find uncomfortable. You need to address those types of things. Lean into the discomfort and ask yourself, why am I feeling uncomfortable with this discussion right now? Yeah, absolutely. And a big part of that is listening. Your experience and perspective is just that. It's yours. And it's insufficient. There are other perspectives that you must listen to. And I think that's been the most beneficial part of our squadron's discussions is allowing people on all sides to speak and be heard and be listened to. Yeah. And that has yielded the most benefit that I have seen in, you know, I'm not that old. I'm old enough though to have seen these things come and go a little bit. Yeah. I've not seen as much progress made as quickly on individual levels as I have this time because people are listening and people are speaking. And it's been a privilege to be a part of, to be honest. Yeah. And then on that note, when you are having these conversations, always consider where your priorities are with respect to the outcome of the discussion and your relationship with those people, with the people in your unit, people in your community, and the people on social media, those quote unquote friends and followers that you have. How much value do you place on winning the argument versus maintaining the relationship with those people or neither, right? Yeah, absolutely. I just don't have time for someone I've never met to have like a rage war on Facebook. Like I, that just doesn't seem to benefit me or them. I think there's better benefit for me listening to the people I do know and love and care about and growing in that way. Yeah. And a great reference on this is the discussion that we had about outcome versus relationship back on episode 13 and the video that you put together for that, that we'll link on the show notes so that you can go see what we are talking about with respect to prioritizing relationship versus outcome. Yeah. Thanks for that plug. That was fun to put together. So why don't we talk a little bit about how this can impact a unit? We've all been parts of units, various units with different environments, different conditions that are in the unit. We've seen how this can work well and how it cannot. I just gave some examples of how my squadron is head-on addressing this challenge of race that we're going through in an incredibly fruitful and incredibly respectful way, and good is happening as a result. I've also been in units where things like this were not addressed appropriately. Yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit about what does this look like a little bit day to day? Yeah. So I've seen this. I've seen people with exceptionally strong political opinions and voice those regularly, and it leads to a breakdown in discipline. It's led to the unit kind of fracturing and kind of picking sides. 
these topics are challenging and emotionally and difficult for a reason because they do divide. And just think about the point of the military. We're there to perform a mission. Yeah. And we're not a whole lot of us. And we must be cohesive. We must be effective as a fighting force, ready at all times, willing to lay down your life if that is required. Can you imagine working for a boss who you knew their political positions because they talked about them regularly, espoused them, you know, pontificated on them regularly, loudly. This person had a position of authority over you. They literally and figuratively held your life and career in their hands. Yeah. And yet everything they believe is completely opposite of what you feel on important topics. Are you going to be an effective warrior for that person? You're just not going to be. I can't see how that, the logic there is just, it's not there. It's not present. It doesn't make sense. So I've seen that. I've seen bosses, officers who had troops that worked for them. They held very publicly positions that were controversial and it made it hard for others to work for them. That is not what we're here to do. We cannot do that. It simply does not work. Yeah. On the flip side, how awesome is it when you are working for that supervisor, that commander, who comes out and says, hey, I understand that there are these issues going on and those issues are important. We're going to talk about them, but we have to stay focused on the mission. We have to stay focused on delivering effective air power on behalf of the American people. And again, keeping things focused on issues, not people. I mean, I've seen it where even in a political environment, I've seen disagreements between lower ranking commanders with higher headquarters and how just that can cause a disruption in good order and discipline and a drop in effectiveness, even over things that are not highly politically charged or divisive, but just that little bit of disruption to good order and discipline is enough to drive down the effectiveness of the military. So if that can create a problem and then you bring something else that is even more politically and socially charged, it's going to cause the unit's ability to carry out the mission to suffer greatly. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen it. Like you said, it can be something as simple as this task that our higher headquarters has asked us doesn't make sense. I don't know why they sent it. The officer, you know, in charge or the, you know, maybe command leadership or something says like, this is the stupidest tasker I've ever heard. Right. The whole office then goes into a 20 minute bitch session about how stupid higher headquarters is. Exactly. That's not good. That's not good. And yeah, compound that with a highly emotionally charged, very difficult, hard problem. I'm not waving my hands over here saying these are all easy things. I think by and large, they're the opposite. They're exceptionally challenging, hard things. And our responsibility is to the American people to be a disciplined fighting force in order to allow them to exercise the freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution. That's our job. Yeah, there's so much more that we could say on this, but I think we've covered it here, Reed. I think we've done a good job of touching on the really important elements of freedom, discipline, our role and responsibility as officers in the Air Force and our relationship and responsibility toward the American people and how all these things interact, especially in this day and age with the issues that we're dealing with right now. Yeah. So I want to do just a quick rundown of some of the instructions we talked about and a summary of Go Ask JA if you're confused, right? I always ended this lesson at OTS with Go Ask JA. Yep. So AFI 51 TAC 508, that's the Air Force instruction. The DOD instruction is 1325.06. The next AFI 1-1, go read those. It's important. You need to understand how it works. When you're dealing with folks in your shop, in your office, and you hear these things, campaign season's coming, Black Lives Matter, unrest is happening now. You have to be able to effectively navigate this space. Why? Because we must be disciplined. We must maintain and establish good order and discipline. That is your responsibility. We talked about what discipline is and how it's the vehicle that establishes trust with the American people. Without that, we cannot do our jobs. And that's the bottom line. We've got to do this so that we can be there for them in the way they ask us to be. Yeah. That's the whole point. So on this Independence Day, we're releasing this episode in and around the 4th of July weekend. We want to wish all of our audience a very happy Independence Day. 
hope uh, that you and yours are celebrating in a way that is bringing you happiness. We are grateful for all those who are wearing the uniform, who have decided to dedicate themselves and their lives to the values and freedom of this nation. Thank you all our brothers and sisters downrange who are serving right now. We are thinking of you, we're praying for you, and we hope that you come back to you and yours whole, safe, and sound quickly. Anything else before we wrap up today, Colin? Again, thank you to our audience, specifically the lieutenant that asked us this question. I just want to say how extremely grateful we are for our incredibly engaged and intelligent audience. We are here for you and your reciprocation on sending these types of questions is exactly why we're doing this podcast. So we hope that this has been useful to you. We hope that you will share it with others. We hope that you will continue to send us your questions so that we can continue to address these types of really important things that are part of the life of being an officer in the Air Force and the profession of arms. And with that, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Okay, Reed, the audience has now heard this episode maybe for the second time if they've listened to it previously. Kudos to them if this is a third or fourth or however many times, if this is something that they've come back to frequently. I feel like the information is worthwhile or Maybe this is their first time. They've just recently joined us. They haven't yet made it through episode 42. They've now had the opportunity to hear us speak on the importance of discipline, the oath that we take as officers to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and how that requires of us in order to protect freedom, to give up many of our own freedoms. And I don't know that there's a whole lot more that we can or should even say about it. I mean, I don't want to uh, say that some additional commentary is not helpful or useful, but I don't know that we need to belabor the point that much. Yeah, I think it stands alone. And I agree. And so the only thing I wanted to add is when I consume information, I always ask myself, so what? What am I going to do? And so... Having listened to this again recently, I did. I'm like, what can I do? What can I do at my level right now to maybe make things a little bit better? And what I am choosing to do is to uphold and enforce standards. Yeah. A recommit, you know, to not walk by things as you described in the episode, because what you walk by is what you accept. That is the standard. And I'm recommitting to not walking by things. You are going to hear your troops or others having politically charged conversations. And that can be healthy and important as we discuss, but it also might not be. And so you have to know, but the point is I'm going to, you know, commit right now to being better about upholding and enforcing standards because it matters. Yeah. And toward that goal, you have to know what the standards are, right? And that was one of the reasons why in the episode we were very, deliberate in pointing out to you all where you can go to find out those standards, right? And the one addition that I want to make here is that one of those documents, Doty 1325-06, was recently updated in a very important way that is applicable to every single one of us. So the document talks about our responsibility as members of the military and the defense establishment with respect to extremist activities and organizations. And when we put out this episode originally, that document said that members of the military will not participate or align themselves with these types of extremist groups, right? You're not going to be a member of the military and a card-carrying member of Hell's Angels or Skinheads or the Crip Gang or something like that, right? And as long as you weren't a participating member in those groups, even if you supported their ideology, you could still serve in the military, right? But that's now changed. And I want to share with you that change, especially as it relates to social media. And this is how every single one of us might be affected by these extremist activities. So paragraph eight Section M of DOTI 1325.06 says that engaging in electronic and cyber activities regarding extremist activities or groups that support extremist activities, including posting, 
liking, sharing, retweeting, or otherwise distributing content is considered participation in an extremist activity. And that is therefore punishable by the UCMJ. So what we want you to understand from this is that you are responsible for the content that you consume and that you participate with, that you interact with in the social media environment on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, Reddit, wherever you get your information. Just the act of liking something, upvoting something, sharing, retweeting it in a personal or a public domain constitutes participation in an extremist activity. So don't do it. That's the so what, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm grateful for that clarification. Previously, it kind of just acknowledged that social media was a thing. It didn't really say, and so it left a lot of questions, right? Can I be a part of a Facebook group of neo-Nazis? You could have been, yeah, before. That was okay. Yeah. Now you cannot if you want to serve in the military. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. And again, same caveats applied as in the episode. We aren't lawyers. If you have questions, I recommend go talking to one. Yeah. But the point is, we really wanted to highlight this stuff because it matters and it's happening. As I said in the header, fast forward 50 years, similar issues will be present. I don't know what they will be, but the principles apply. Discipline matters. You play a role in that. And we want to be part of the solutions, not part of the problem. Yeah. So be aware of the standard. Be aware of the conversations that are taking place. Participate. Please participate in the political process. This is the kind of stuff that you have sworn an oath to support and defend. We want people to have these heated conversations because this is how society improves. This is how we move toward our common goals. We have to have these discussions. We have to hold our political leaders accountable for the promises that they provide. And we do that with our votes, right? And so if you choose to not participate, if you choose to withdraw and hide behind your oaths, that is not a good place to be. But you need to understand the right and left limits of your oath and the amount of maneuver space that you have available to you. Yeah. Because honestly, Colin, what are we defending? if it isn't the opportunity to continue this experiment. Right. So thanks for joining us this week. Anything else we want to highlight before we wrap up today, Colin? No, that'll be it for me. Awesome. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Net. Commission Net.